Welcome to The Brian Buffini Show, where we explore the mindsets, motivation, and methodologies of success. My name is David Lally, producer of the show, and whatever you might be experiencing today, this episode should give you great hope and encouragement for the future. What you're going to hear is a list of challenges the Buffini family faced, one after another. I had a front row seat to each of these events, any one of which could have destroyed a person or a family. I watched Brian and Beverly handle a series of crises in a way that made their relationship better, their family stronger, and ultimately led to years of prosperity in their business and in their lives. I think it'll be very helpful, and I hope you enjoy it. Well, the top of the morning to you. Welcome to the Brian Buffini Show. Have a a helpful message for you here today. It's entitled Lessons from the Ashes. What this is all about is how do you come back after experiencing a trial, a setback, a difficulty, or a series of trials. I'm going to share with you a little bit of my own story in, in a season I went through, a season of trial that lasted about 18 months. And out of that came some of the best things in my life and some of the best uh, circumstances and, and a chance to recalibrate. And I want to talk to you about that today. So maybe you're in the middle of a trial right now. Maybe you're in a series of trials. Maybe you're uh, it's like nothing is getting right. You've gotten a bad diagnosis. A family member's gotten a bad diagnosis. You have a ailing parents, maybe a kid that's off the rails, a business that's struggling, financial mistakes made. Maybe you have relationships in crisis. You know, there's just so many different trials for the human condition. There's just many, many people, I'm sure, who are and have experienced things that I can't even imagine. The loss of a child, uh, the death of a spouse, uh, you know, just so many different things. But I'm going to speak to you today about the other side of the trials and how to keep your head up and how to keep moving on in the midst of the trial. I'm going to speak to you as transparently as I can. You know, for me, I got the chance to hear Frank Sinatra near the end of his life sing My Way. And he wasn't at his crooning best. He was an aged star. He was within 18 months of passing. But that had nothing to do with it. I I don't know that the man could have ever sung that song better. And the reason being is that when Frank Sinatra sang My Way, you knew he had lived an awful lot of life. And when he sang the words, it resonated at such a deep level, and people were just weeping, not just at the familiarity of a famous singer singing one of his, you know, stock hits. The dynamic of connecting with the trials and the tribulations of life, and when uh, Old Blue Eyes sang that song, everyone in that room knew that man had lived the life and a huge life behind it, with all kinds of ups and downs. And so that's where the emotion was. So I'm going to give you my version of old blue eyes here for a second. I've been through many things in my life. And I'll be honest with you, I'm a big fan of Winston Churchill. And, you know, he said, success is going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. And I have taken a lot of lumps. And my brothers used to call me Chumba Wumba. There was a song they sing, I get knocked down, but I get up again because you're never going to keep me down. I've always been that guy. When I was a kid, my favorite movie was Cool Hand Luke, because no matter what you did to Cool Hand Luke, you couldn't get him to quit. You couldn't get him to give up. Or as the prison system would say, get your mind right. So uh, perseverance has kind of been a hallmark for me for a long time. Having said that, you know, they say, whatever you do, don't pray for patience, because God might try to test you in that. I had an 18-month period of time with my bride and life where it, it just came at us from every angle you can imagine. Obviously, we're the largest coaching and training company for real estate agents. And so we had a giant worldwide economic meltdown centered in real estate. Well, Buffini and Company knew there was a recession, and it was a deep recession, a year before Wall Street did, because we were seeing it in the lives and the businesses of the people we were coaching. You know, we had 400 employees. This recession was centered in real estate. And for a lot of people, when they think about the Great Recession, And they think about real estate, they go, oh man, you know, real estate values dropped 30 to 35%. And that was the crisis. And there was a mortgage crisis and all that stuff. Well, let me say to you, you know, my business works in the area where agents are being productive. We got to help agents be productive. And when agents are productive, then they pay for our coaching and our training programs and so on and so forth. Well, half the agents left the business. And of those that were left, they were making about half what they used to make. All told, the real estate market went down 30 to 35%, but the real estate agent income, which is where Buffini and Company serves as an industry, went down 80%. 
And 80% in a major industry is cataclysmic. We had 27 competitors at the time of going into the recession. When we came out, there was us and one other company in, uh, left standing. We had to go through a brutal time of letting staff go. I'm talking about when people come to work at a feening company, they fall in love with the mission, they fall in love with the culture. And a lot of folks refer their family and friends and it's very hard to get hired in this place. And so when we would let somebody go, it was like letting a family member go. Well, we went from 400 employees down to 112 employees. You talk about laying off 280 people who feel like family, that was excruciating. My own economics in order to keep the doors open, I sold $40 million worth of my own family's personal real estate to get the money to keep the doors open at Buffini Company. Our industry was in a free fall. Our business was in free fall. Our staff went through free fall. Then I went through a financial free fall, keeping the doors open. Oh, but wait, there's more. Uh, my family of origin went through a major spat. Now, that's not really headline news. Irish families, by nature, put the fun in dysfunction, okay? Nobody knows how to fight and hold a grudge like an Irishman. But that was going on at the same time. There was stress I was experiencing that I never experienced before. Um, it caused a health crisis. I ended up having 18 inches of my colon removed. All stress-related digestive problems. And then to top it off, just to, and there was a whole host of other things that went on, but to top it off, then there was a fire. And my wife and kids, we had six kids under the age of 12 at the time. We took a vacation to Hawaii and then came back to Chicago. We were hanging out with my good friend, Joe Nego and his family. And then we're guests of Lou Holtz to go to Notre Dame. So Notre Dame was bringing this statue in for Lou Holtz. I was involved in helping get the statue done for Lou. And it was a great deal, and he hosted us, and we're out there at this game. And we fly in, we get in real late at night. We've been on, on the road for two weeks. And unbeknownst to us, the October Santa Ana winds had been blowing brush and drying out all the ground and drying out everything. And we had a 12,000 square foot Georgia plantation style home. The name of it, when the realtor sold it, was called the Western White House. It was a white wooden home, it was beautiful, but it had six balconies with basically the greatest kindling for a fire you ever saw. So we get in late at night. I got six little kids. Bev and I load them in. We get to sleep. And we didn't even know there were fires in Southern California. And they were coming fast. And the Santa Anas were blown. And we get a phone call at 2.30 in the morning. Hey, reverse 911, automatic call. There's a fire in your area. Be prepared to evacuate. Well, I had heard that call before. But we were in an area that there had never been a fire near the Wild Animal Park in San Diego. Well, five minutes later, there's two fire trucks down the end of our driveway pushing the button going, you guys need to leave in the next five minutes. And if you can imagine taking six kids out of a dead sleep and putting them into cars and this and that and the other and whatever else, that's what we did. And we left everything. We left with the shirts on our back. We still didn't think our house was in danger, but we wanted to obey the fire department and we had six young kids. So we, we headed out that day. We got in one car and left everything but except with the shirts on our backs. Well, Truth be told, the fire came and it consumed that house. And there were metal beams inside that house that takes like 13, 1400 degrees to melt. And they were melted, gone. There was nothing left. And an ironic story is I had one commissioned statue in the, my backyard, right by my house, of the statue of Job. And um, one of my favorite characters in the Bible, a guy who'd been through a bunch of tough times. And uh, around it was a saying in Hebrew, I'm reduced to dust and ashes. And maybe some other day I'll give you a whole story about that statue. What's wild is the insurance adjuster said it looked like a bomb hit it. He was from New York and he looks like a bomb hit your house. And the house was gone. The sidewalks were gone. Everything was gone, reduced to ashes, except that statue of Job, which sits outside my current home today. So basically a partridge in a pear tree and everything that could go wrong did go wrong. And we went through this whole thing and, and it didn't get any better. It didn't get any better because we had to move the six kids. We stayed in a hotel for six weeks. In fact, we were staying at La Costa Resort and Spa where Bev and I are members. And when we left, the manager said, Mr. Buffini, we hate to lose you, but uh, a rock band is moving in next week and we're looking forward to it because it's going to be a lot quieter around here than your family. <laughs> so, you know, and it was crazy. We moved into a rental house and paid $10,000 a month to rent that house. And one day I'm on the road speaking. I get a call from Beverly. Someone knocked at the door. This house has been foreclosed on. We have three days to move. We were paying 10 grand a month. The guy wasn't paying his mortgage because it was a worldwide recession. We ended up having to move six times with our family of eight over the next 18 months. That season was just one big giant season of trial. Now, like I said, 
the hundreds of thousands of people listening to this call today, you, many of you have been through an awful lot worse time than that. But what I will say is as a guy who is a lifelong student and a guy who wants to learn from experience and then pass on anything I learn or that's benefited me, I learned a lot during that period of time. And that's what this is about. That's what these lessons are about. These lessons from the ashes. And so you go through a period of time like that, there's a lot of different ways to deal with it. There's booze, alcohol. You can check out into anything you want. There's drugs. People have affairs. There's this and that. And other. People can go in any one of a hundred different directions in dealing with this kind of a trial uh, or a series of trials. But for me, I knew I had the, I had the blessing of having that Job statue sitting in my yard. And I felt like, you know, the color purple, you know, God is trying to tell you something. That was the song they sang. And I was like, maybe God's trying to tell me something. And it's time for me to listen. So here's what I got from it. Whatever this helps you with, or this can use to be helping a friend, or gives you a word of encouragement today, that'll be this. So I have three things that I got from the fire. And uh, I probably got more, but I'm going to tell you three, because three is what you can remember. And that's my format. And that's what we're going to talk about. So the three lessons I have for you are, number one, the refining fire. Number two, new beginnings. And number three, I'll, I'll say what I learned, which is to simplify my life and I'll share for you to simplify your life. So the refining fire, new beginnings and simplifying my life. So first and foremost, the refining fire. One of the things we use to describe a refining fire is the, is the dynamic of a crucible, right? So a crucible is a, a ceramic or a metal container in which metals or other substances are melted after being under very high heat, right? And so, for example, uh, you've seen a smelter or things like that, right? The gold is refined in the crucible they talk about. The crucible is also uh, referenced to a, a situation of severe trial in which different elements interact, leading to the creation of something new. Isn't that kind of magic? And this is one of the ways to look at difficulties and setbacks. And it's either, I believe this, I think you either get humble or you get humbled. And when the crap happens and when the stuff comes at you or when patterns arise over and over again, you either get humble and learn from them or you're going to be humbled and bad things are coming your way. So the crucible itself, like just this ceramic container, right? They, they heat it. It can go from anywhere from 1,000 to 2,900 degrees, right? The house fire, they said for me, was about 1,300 degrees to melt the I-beams. Gold requires about 2,000 degrees. Now, this is important, right? Because you can think about this. What separates 14 karat gold from 18 karat gold to 24 karat gold, right, is the purer the gold, the more valuable it is. And how does gold become purer? How does it become more valuable? Is that it's put in the crucible and put under this intense heat. How do we become more valuable as human beings? Is that through these trials and through the, the intense heat of life, the impurities get burned off. Now, sometimes we can replace those impurities with other impurities. And don't ask me theologically for all of this. I met the great Thomas Keating years ago, who was the guy who, in the Catholic tradition, basically brought to life contemplative prayer from the 1400s. And he brought it to life here in Snowmass, Colorado, in the last 40 years. And a, a very influential, brilliant guy, and basically introduced and reintroduced a form of Christian meditation to the world. And I, we was a part of a Q&A session with him one time, and he was asked, where, where do you go with God and uh, God's sovereignty and God being good and all of these great tragedies that happen and difficult things that happens? And he said, I, I don't really have answers for all of this, but I can tell you this, somewhere inside the infinite love of God is a place for suffering. And it doesn't explain everything, but it does explain some part of it, that, and it does help a lot of times. You know, people say, this, well, there's a reason for everything, right? Nothing happens by accident. And these difficult circumstances, many times that is the case. And many times it's helping us to become purer, more valuable. Like you say, 24 karat gold has been put in the heat. You take 18 karat gold, you throw it in the crucible, and you reheat it to 2,000 degrees. And now the last imperfections come out of that gold, and it becomes 25% more valuable, right? And that's why we get older in life, you get a lot of experiences, and some of the experiences are the things you don't want, but you're back in the crucible. And it gives you a chance to be pure. Now, it also gives you a chance to be bitter and brutal. And, you know, uh, Joe Nego and I have traveled an awful lot. And Joe says to me one time, I don't want to be the angry old white guy in first class. And it doesn't mean that everyone in first class is an angry old white guy. But on occasion, you'll see him. This is the person who's had the experiences. But instead of 
improving and getting refined and being better, they become more cynical and more crabby and more complaining about everything. And they complain about the wine and they complain about the drinks and they complain about the food. They complain about the temperature. They complain about the turbines. They complain about everything. And then they complain about you sitting next to them. Or you get into a conversation with them and they start complaining. Now, here's the thing. That person's been in the crucible, but every time they've gotten burned, they've added back in impurities. And instead of becoming more valuable, they become less valuable, less valuable to their family, their friends, their customers, less valuable to society, certainly less valuable to the poor flight attendants that have to put up with them. And so that's Joe's always thing. I don't want to be the angry old white guy. It's good stuff. Wintley Phipps, the greatest, well, just the most amazing singer. We've had him at our events many times. If you ever get a chance, look up Wintley Phipps. He sings Amazing Grace. And it was, uh, I think it's one of the most watched YouTube videos of all time. Absolutely incredible. He had a statement he made at our Mastermind Summit that said, it is in the quiet crucible of your personal private sufferings that your noblest dreams are born and God's greatest gifts are given. Very, very powerful. So first of all, we have the crucible. The second part about the refining fire is there's the heat. And the heat is, uh, it's kind of uncomfortable. You can't always control it. And it kind of exposes and, and shows the weaknesses, okay? And that's okay. It's just part of the deal. The great British theologian Charles Hadley Spurgeon says, trials teach us what we are. They dig up the soil and they let us see what we're made of, you know? And James Allen, as a man thinketh, which you know I'm a big fan of, in his book he said, circumstances do not make the man, they reveal him. So that's the fire itself. So we have the crucible, we have the heat, and then you have the refining process itself, right? So when you're going through the refining process, here's the first thing to know. Impurities rise to the surface. So what happens? Under stress, our short-term shortcomings come out. If you're a short-tempered person, you'll be short-tempered. If you're prone to anger, you'll be angry. If you're prone to isolation and cutting people off, you'll be more isolated and cut more people off. Whatever your predisposition is, when we get into the refining process, the impurities rise to the surface. The second thing is that impurities in gold doesn't hurt the gold, but the removing impurities in the human heart, that hurts. And it's the kind of personal growth that nobody wants. You know, everybody wants to sign on for, Brian, what book should I read? I want to listen to this podcast, get fired up. What seminar do I go to? Da, 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 da. But the real growth often happens is when the sucky stuff's going on and we're growing in the areas we don't want to grow in. You know, it's not our favorite subject in school, if you know what I mean. And then lastly, like I said, 24 karat gold. Here, here's the good news. 24 karat gold is 99% pure. It's not 100% pure. And the, the job is never done. The perfection is never reached, okay? In the refining fire, we have the crucible, the heat, and the refining process itself. We do all kinds of research here at Puffini Company. We'll, we'll quote somebody who's on the news today, and we'll quote a Greek philosopher from a couple thousand years ago. A famous Greek philosopher named Epictetus said this, when you actively engage in gradually refining yourself, you retreat from your lazy ways of covering yourself or making excuses. Instead of feeling a persistent current of low-level shame, you move forward by using the creative possibilities of this moment, your current situation. Awesome stuff. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm under the gun, I start making excuses. And then when we know we're not at our best and we're not doing our best things or we're not reacting the best way, we feel this low level of shame or regret. And so we get to move forward by the creative possibilities of this moment, your current situation. Think about it. It's 2,000 years ago. Believe it or not, this is before Instagram. Believe it or not, this is before the 24-hour news cycle. Guess what? The human condition hasn't really changed in thousands of years. It's the same. And people struggle with stuff back then that they're struggling with now profound stuff. So the refining fire that all of us have felt, and the longer you'll be on this planet, the more refining you'll get. The crucible, the heat, and the refining process itself. So let's talk about this second lesson from the ashes, which is new beginnings. When you go through the fire, when everything turns upside down, there's a chance for some new beginnings. One of the very encouraging things, and it wasn't just because it was a fire, but was the mentality of December 10th, 1914, a massive explosion erupted in West Orange, New Jersey. Ten buildings 
in the legendary inventor Thomas Edison's plant, which made up more than half of the site, were engulfed in flames. Almost eight fire departments were on the scene, the entire fire departments. But this was a chemical-fueled inferno, and it was just too powerful to be put out. It was just burned to the ground. Now think about Edison. This is the guy in our world today. You're talking about 1914. A hundred years later, the phonograph, how we listen to music, motion pictures, how we're watching movies, the light bulb, okay? I mean, on and on. He had 875 patents. How many things were in all of these buildings that burned up? How many inventions? How many near to completion inventions? How many patents? How many all these things that he'd been working on? Now, by the way, I'm going to give you the quote, and then I'm going to give you my perspective on the quote. Thank goodness all of our mistakes were burned up. Now we can start fresh again. Now, let me just do this for a second, because this is where the motivational speakers, self-help books in the airport are full of bull sometimes. That's not the first thing Thomas Edison felt. As the guy that had his house burned out, that ain't the first thing I thought about. Here, I'll give you one example. On my street, I was the only house that burned down. In my neighborhood, I was the only house that burned down. I drove out of my neighborhood every day and I drive past all these houses and I didn't wish bad on anyone else, but I looked up to the heavens and go, why in the hell did my house burn down and these not? And then the fire jumped over the freeway and it burned somebody else's house and it didn't burn the house next to it and it seemed extremely capricious. Now, I didn't shake my fist in the air and say, why me, God? And I didn't have that degree. But I just want you to know this, because sometimes the history and the editing process, it's different than it was, okay? So what happens is the motivational speaker or whatever, and I'm one of those, says, thank goodness all our mistakes were burned up. Now we can start fresh again. I guarantee, I'll bet you every dollar I have in my life, that's not the first freaking thing that Thomas Edison said. And the reason why I'm bringing that up is that we often have this other standard of how other people deal with stuff and so on and so forth. That's the conclusion he came to. That's what he learned. Now, I will say this. For me, it took me 18 months to embrace that. While I was busy doing this and doing that and whatever else. It took me 18 months. This might have been a quote much later in Edison's life. What happens is when we hear the story and we hear the quote, what happens is people self-incriminate themselves. Well, that's not what I'm thinking. Something must be wrong with me. Or I'm weak. Or I'm not this. Or I'm not that. Just so you know, that's the story that's told and the story's true, but it's not the whole story. Okay? So here's the fresh start approach. Things have gone sideways. Things have gone upside down. The number one thing you're faced with is a choice. There's a choice. And there's a choice on how you look at things, how you think of things, and then how you act. So for example, one of the most prized possessions in our family. Now we lost stuff that is heirlooms. We lost stuff that is without any price. My grandfather became a U.S. citizen 75 years to the exact day that I became a, a U.S. citizen. February 22nd, 2002 for me, and his was February 22nd, 75 years to the day, with the exact same form, by the way. The form is identical. And my dad gave me this. So I had mine, and I had my grandfather's next to another. That went away, and it can't be replaced, and I can't get the records, and this and that and the other. We lost stuff my mother gave me from her mother, things that Beverly had from her all-American stuff. She had six suitcases set up for each one of her kids with all of these shoes and shirts and hats and sweat tops and this and any other from her Olympic experience and things that were saved for them to give to him one day. I had journaled every single day of my life, every single day of my life, I journaled for 22 years. And I saved them in this cedar chest at the end of my desk. It was gone. It was gone. And I planned on leaving that to my kids. And I also went back and revisited all the time. So of all the things I'm talking about, the thing that was probably most precious to me in Beverly was our collection of books. When we moved into that house, the moving company gave us one bid for our furniture and a second bid for our books. We had an entire thousand square foot basement, which is unheard of in California. But uh, we had, it was behind this huge bookshelf and you spun the bookshelf around like a secret compartment in a Harry Potter movie. And there was a spiral stone staircase down to what was called Kid's Kingdom. In that Kids' Kingdom were thousands of books. And then I had my own library, floor to ceiling library with a ladder that went around. Beverly in her office, same thing, with a ladder that went around. Every book we had was gone. All of our notes in there, all of our things in there, everything. So a way to look at this as a choice is when we built our new house, we built a very nice home, not a lot of wood on the exterior, if you get my drift. And Beverly had a huge library, and I had a huge library, and we had no books. 
it was on the first day and it kind of take your breath away. Well, one of the ways to look at this is, and the way I framed this for Beverly was this, guess what? We get to start over. So we get to go buy a book that was one of our favorites, read it again as if new, and then put it on the bookshelf. And I got to tell you, it was one of the most joyous things in my life to, to start over again and read how to win friends and influence people and read the book again. And oh, by the way, after 18 months in the crucible, I got things out of that book I had never gotten before. And I had read that book 10 or 15 times. I read The Richest Man in Babylon and I read it again and I've taught it in hundreds of thousands of copies I've helped sell of that book. And I read it again and it was like the first time I'd ever read it. And bit by bit by bit, all of these different things. Now, we didn't get to replace all of what we had. My wife loves to study theology. We had original writings from Puritan authors and this and that and the other and one-of-a-kind books that disappeared. We never fully replaced what we had, but we made the choice to begin the new. And today in our home, and we have all the books, every book on the shelf in my home and in my office and in Beverly's office is there by choice. It's been read, and it was rediscovered again. There was actually kind of a blessing in all of that in a big way. You know, the great Ogmandino said, today I begin a new life. Today I shed my old skin, which had too long suffered the bruises of failure and the wounds of mediocrity. When you go under the gun, you get into the fire, all hell breaks loose. One of the things you get to do, all our mistakes are burned up. Let's start over. That can happen in a relationship. That can happen in a business. That can happen in finances. That can happen in health. That can happen in your attitudes. It can happen in anything. We have to believe the change is possible. We have to. Next, perseverance. Perseverance is a big part of the, the fresh start. And here's why. You know, you can have all the platitudes and whatever else, but you still find yourself in a sucky situation. It took us weeks and weeks and weeks to make a list of all the things we needed to get and needed to replace. Imagine, big home, all this stuff, homeschooled our kids, and you got nothing. I remember the first time we went to uh, Costco, we rented two Suburbans because our cars all burned down as well. And we went in, and if you can picture those big metal trolleys with just the rail on the front and then it's wide open, I had one that was stacked about four feet high, and then I had another one. So I'm pushing one and pulling the other. Beverly's pushing one and pulling the other. We had no towels. We had no cups. We had no napkins. We had no underwear. We had no socks. We had no shoes. Got six kids. Boom. Load up the Suburbans. You know, go through the little security checkout at, at uh, Costco. Load up the Suburbans. Go. We made a trip over a weekend three times where we carried four giant pallets of products out of Costco. The last time we were going through, the security guy who'd been there for the two days looks at me and goes, um, is everything okay? You know, you don't have to buy it all today. And I went, oh, dude, we lost our house in the fire. And so I, it was good to make him feel like a schmuck. So it was great. The bottom line is we made a list of things to do, and I stopped that list when I reached the 700th item. I went through it, and I'm a little anal accounting background. I counted up, and we had 700 things to do. And some of them were like, cancel a home insurance, buy a car buy clothes, get a suit to go present on stage with, uh, get your marriage licenses, get your birth certificates, get a passport. I mean, you can't even imagine. It was years and years would go by and we'd go, oh, I need that. Oh, no, I don't have that anymore. Oh, I need that. So the perseverance is you feel overwhelmed. There's a gazillion things to do. And no matter what you're dealing with in your life and you go through a trial and life goes upside down, maybe you've been through a divorce and you've moved into an apartment and you're starting over. And it's just overwhelming. Maybe you screwed up financially and you're starting over. Who knows? Maybe you didn't screw up, but it happened to you anyway. And you're overwhelmed. Well, you make your list. And then, as Ogmandino said in The Greatest Salesman, I will persist until I succeed. You know, John D. Rockefeller, who was the wealthiest American who ever lived, said, I do not think there is any other quality so essential to success of any kind as the quality of perseverance. It overcomes almost everything even nature. Now, when I read that quote, my excuses went out the window because I didn't have a control over a wildfire. It was a bummer that he put even nature in there because it took away my last excuse. Martin Luther King said it this way. If you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. Last but not least in the fresh start is just don't put things off. You know, life is short. Not so long ago, Kobe Bryant and his daughter, along with 
a number of other people lost their life in a tragic helicopter crash. And I have no idea, but it's one of those seminal moments. It was a Sunday morning. It was quiet. He's a famous guy. He's a basketball player. He has this beautiful little daughter he doted on. But for whatever reason, sometimes in life, things just cut through. And Kobe Bryant and his daughter Gigi's death seemed to just strike a nerve. A deep nerve, far beyond perhaps the timing of it all and what it was. And maybe it was on a different day or a different news cycle or whatever else. But on the day it happened and the way it happened and what happened and the fact that death affects us all, family, loved one, a little girl, a superstar cut down in the prime of his life, whatever it was, it was this devastating thing. And I remember here's Shaquille O'Neal and Shaquille O'Neal and him had been great friends and won championships together and then had a bunch of falling out and so on and so forth. And in recent years had kind of patched it up and got back together. And he's on TV show and they're asking him and he just, he's bawling his eyes out and he goes, I've been working too much. I've been spending too much time away from home. I need to spend more time with my kids. You know, I've made a lot of money, and I I don't know why I get up every day just keep making money. I give a lot of it away and so on and so forth. What hit him? Life is short. Life is short. Life is too short to get caught up in the tragedies of the past. Life is too short to keep entering into a crucible and paying the price multiple times over for the purification you've already gone through. General Patton said, when it came to war, I hate paying for the same real estate twice. What do you mean by that? They just spent a week in battle and overcame 30 miles of the enemy in battle. He didn't want to give up that ground. That ground had sacrifice in it. That ground had blood in it. That ground had all the trials it took to make that advance. And he's like, I don't like paying for the same real estate twice. Well, that's why we don't want to put things off. Life is short. Procrastination is the silent killer. Act now. In Kobe Bryant's fire that ultimately ended in tragedy, Shaquille O'Neal and many other people have gotten the wake-up call, life is short. Michael Jordan, who rarely speaks in public, spoke at Kobe Bryant's memorial service and with tears streaming down his face. And and he said at the time, this is probably going to be a meme I'm going to have to look at for the next three years because of the public world we live in today. But he said, I have six-year-old girls I need to spend more time with and I'm going to devote myself to. Sometimes we can learn from somebody else's fire. Sometimes we can learn from someone else's tragedy. And putting it off and putting off the good life, nothing good comes from that. Mason Cooley, who was an American writer, said, procrastination makes easy things hard and hard things harder. Wayne Gretzky, the great one, they called him, said, procrastination is one of the most common and deadliest of all diseases and its toll on success and happiness is heavy. One of my favorite quotes from Agmandino, he says, failures act as if they had a thousand years to live. And he spoke extemporaneously about that because he was speaking transparently, because he was throwing his life away. He'd become an alcoholic. He'd been in the fiery furnace. He'd lost a marriage. He'd lost a relationship with his daughter. He had PTSD because of the war. And he was throwing his life away, and he was about to end his life in suicide. And he decided not to. And he decided, I'm not going to be a failure now. I'm going to act. I don't have a thousand years to live. I'm going to get it now. And so those new beginnings, after you come out of the fire, there's benefits of that fresh start. Perseverance, the greatest of all the character qualities, and then don't put things off. Last but not least here, the biggest lesson I learned for myself was to simplify my life. And by the way, this fire happened 13 years ago. And as I'm recording this to you today, I can tell you, as I'm sharing this with you, I have managed to simplify my life and then complicate the hell out of it again. And what I'm doing is I'm listening to this and preparing for this podcast. I am making commitments myself to simplify my life so I don't have to have the next fire happen. Get humble or be humbled. And as I'm sharing this information with you because I lived it, it's very visceral, it's very real to me, and I simplified my life. And by the way, life gets complicated. Life is complicated. The world is complicated. Come on, right now? The world's bat nuts crazy. I don't, politically, socially, this and any other. I mean, one of my favorite commercials right now is the world needs a Snickers. You know, the world is bat nuts crazy and we're going to do this big giant hole in the air and here's the Instagrammers falling in and the world has its Snickers in a twist, if you know what I mean. So what we need to do is simplify our lives. And so what I did then and what I'm doing right now 
as the guy who's the Mr. Success talking to you about success, here's what the exercise I'm doing in the next 90 days. If I were starting over, what would I do? That's the question. And that's this question on the top of the sheet of paper. If I were starting over, what would I do? What is working right now? And it's very important, you know, when you're focused on all the crap that's going on, when we work with our company and we meet with departments, okay, there's problems. First thing we do is what's working? What's working right? And so you need to start there. Then it's what direction do I want to go in and what small steps can I take? Okay. And that's a real big deal to simplify your life. So here's the question. Give yourself this gift. If you were starting over, what would you choose to do and who would you choose to do it with? So what would you choose to do and who would you choose to do it with? Next, what would you remove from your schedule and what would you add? This is the exercise that I'm actually going through and have been going through for the past month and a half with regards to my own business. And then what habits or routines would you change? What habits or routines would you change? Socrates said, the secret of change is to focus all of your energy, not on fighting the old, but building the new. What would you do if you were starting over? Maybe you are starting over. Maybe there's a joy in that, even if there's pain that got to that place, okay? A good friend of mine, got diagnosed with stage four cancer and he's going through the process. And one of the things I'm talking to him about is envisioning and visualizing his new life after he gets through this, after he gets healed, after he gets better. And what are you going to live for and what will you do differently and how will you do it? It's a good time. It's a good time even in the fire to think about what you'll do different. And so we talk about what's working now. You know, you think about what are the relationships that you have now that you can invest more in? What habits or routines can you reinforce? Okay, what can we do? Sometimes there's a fire all around you, but you need to keep going with it, right? And one of my favorite verses is in the book of Galatians. It says, let us not grow weary in doing good for in due season, we will reap if we do not give up. Very powerful. You know, so those habits, maybe the fire is you've had bad habits and those bad habits are, are killing you. Maybe it's health or weight or whatever else. And so maybe... Charles Deeg's The Power of Habit is the book you need to get and look that up. It's D-U-H-I-G-G, Charles, and it's The Power of Habit. Lastly, what small steps can you take today? You know, what are the small steps? Here's a great way to come out of the fire. Make a list of who and what you're grateful for, okay? Not the fire, not the problems, not the trial, but who and what are you grateful for, okay? Then take small steps. I had a list of 700 things. Here was the most crushing thing. I would have a very productive day. Beverly would have a very productive day. We'd divide and conquer. She got five things done on the list and I'd get six. And you think about it, you get 11 things, sometimes major things done in a day. It's a pretty awesome day. Except at the end of the day, when we had 11 things done, we had 689 to go. So you have to celebrate the day for what it is. And we had a formula at the time in our company that we call win the day. And we came up with this thing back in the late 90s, win the day, trying to coach and train our agents. And it ended up going through our seminar cycle. Other people picked it up. It ended up as part of slogans for universities like the University of Oregon, Nike got involved, all these things. And I was like, I don't care. Knock yourself out. But win the day. And we've been talking about the win the day formula as a guide to help the people we coach in business to be successful for 25 years. And so all of a sudden, I got a chance to live it myself. So win the day. And then the last thing is build on your momentum. Momentum is a powerful thing. Old man Mo, I call it. You need to have it. You need to get it. Any kind of momentum at all. Let's say somebody's $100,000 in debt. I was in uh, Seattle here a few weeks ago, and we have one of our clients, Joanne Zembrowski, a fantastic story. She was $150,000 in credit card debt when we started. And today, she's one of the most successful agents in the United States and pulling down seven figures a year and doing remarkable things. But you know what we did with Joanne? It's like, okay, let's see if you can make a payment, right? Let's see if you can make a minimum payment. Great. Let's see if you can pay down $1,000. And every time there was a celebration and a woohoo. And then let's see if you can pay down $2,000. Let's see if you can pay down $5,000. And within a couple of years, she was debt free. And within a couple of years, she was a millionaire. And within a couple of years after that, now she's a mentor and an influencer, and has a great team, and she's great in the community. And Last year, uh, I was sharing her story from stage. She says, I'm going to go to every one of the events out there so I can be of value to the people coming to the event who may be going through a hard time. And she came all over the country and traveled all over North America to make herself available to talk to people because when we share her story and I'd say, she's right here. 
And she would get swamped by people just to make herself valuable and to be available. Powerful stuff. So we talked in this part here, simplifying your life. Look at it as if you were starting over, what would you do? Make sure you focus on what's working now. And then what are the small steps you can take? So what do we cover today? The lessons from the ashes, the refining fire, those new beginnings, and ultimately simplifying your life. Sometimes we can learn from somebody else's fire. Kobe and Gigi's passing. Someone you know getting the bad diagnosis. Someone you know going through a trial. And it always brings it, and it always should bring us back to what's important and why. Life is short. What I'll say to you, and what I've said many times before, if I knew all the good that would come from that season of life, I'd have set fire to the house myself. I would have taken the videos of the kids when they were small. I would have kept my grandfather's citizenship documents, and I'd have kept a few other little things here and there. But if I knew all the good that would have come out of what came out of that season and ultimately accumulated in that fire, I would have set the house on fire myself. My family came away from that fire as close, connected, completely unattached to materialism. My kids flew on a private jet 17 years of their life. You know what? They're absolutely delighted when they sit on a double-decker bus in Dublin going to visit their grandma. They're delighted to sleep on the floor because grandma's tiny little house doesn't have any room. They're as delighted. They're connected. We went from a 12,000 square foot house to living at one stage in a guest house that was smaller than my house in Ireland. And they're all sleeping on the floor. And you know what? Those guys are still thick as thieves. It connected us with a community. It connected us with family like never before. There were so many lessons I learned. There were so many things we started over. And guess what the blessing is now? As I prepared for this today, it brought me back to that place. And now that I'm looking at too busy a schedule with too many demands, where a life that needs to get simplified has gotten overwhelmed again, I get to apply the same lessons I learned before without having the next house burn down. And so hopefully today there's something in this message for you. Maybe it's time to share the podcast with a friend and say, here's this dude. He doesn't just speak about houses burning down and life turning sideways, but there might be something in here that encourages you. We always like to provide something of value. We always are sharing these quotes. So the fantastic team here at the Brian Buffini Show have put together this beautiful resource of images and of quotes from kind of the last year of things on the podcast, quotes we've had, quotes that'll encourage, inspire, and keep you going so you can download them so that you can print this thing off. Maybe you give this as a gift. Maybe you just have it on a scroll, on a tablet, on your iPad, whatever you're able to do technologically. So we have this little gift for you, a little resource for you today. I hope you enjoy it today. You can tell in my voice that this message is very personal to me. It's very impactful for me. And I'll be honest with you. Sometimes you give it out in slices, it comes back in lows. Maybe none of you out there will be as impacted today by this podcast as much as I will because I get a chance to learn from these lessons myself in preparing it for you. And so, like you say, you give it out in slices, it comes back in low. So I thank you for tuning in. I hope this has been a blessing to you. I'm going to hand it over to Mr. Lally, who's going to tell you how to go get this nice resource of all these quotes. And uh, whatever you're going through, whatever you're dealing with, I, I just hope you keep your chin up, keep your hopes up, keep your eyes up, look up, pray up, fellowship up, and uh, keep up, and you'll be just fine. Uh, lessons are coming and better days lies ahead. Thanks for joining me today. God bless. It's been a privilege with you. I'm going to throw it over to you, Mr. Dave. Thanks, Brian. To grab the awesome quote book you heard about, visit the com slash insiders. And before I leave today, I wanted to read a listener review from Apple Podcasts. Yolo Graham says, I have just discovered this podcast and the man is a powerhouse of wisdom, motivation, and tools. Over the years of listening to all sorts of podcasts, I have never heard anyone more convincing, more focused, and driven to change the course of human life. Your words are a guidepost and a lighthouse. Wow, powerful stuff. Thanks so much for the feedback, and thanks to all of you who tune in. And as I sign off today, I'll leave you with a little Irish blessing from our favorite, Brian's mum, Therese. May the road rise up to meet you, and may the wind always be at your back. May the rain fall soft upon your fields and the sun shine warm upon your face. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the hollow of his hand. See you next time.